Hey everyone. So in this video, we're gonna cover a few problems from the midterm one review activity. And we're gonna really go over the problems that uh, were requested the most through the midterm one review survey. And so here, the first problem I'd like to start with is 1a. So here we are given a piecewise function and we wanna find the limit as x approaches zero of this piecewise function. And so maybe to get a better sense of what this function looks like, um, or how it behaves, let's graph this function. And so here, uh, where it's, this function looks like x squared minus one for x values less than or equal to zero. And so what that's saying is that on the left side of this graph, right, or, or the left side of this coordinate plane, the graph of this function looks like x squared minus one. And so that's just our typical y is equal to x squared parabola, but just shifted down one unit, right? So here, uh, we see these points on our graph. And we're including this point here at x is equal to zero because uh, you know, this is how we define our function for x values less than or equal to zero, so including zero itself. And then on the right side of our graph, um, we're looking at, uh, so here when the x values are greater than zero, we're looking at the, the graph of the function uh, 2x minus one. So this is a line with a slope of two and a y-intercept of zero comma negative one. And so that graph looks something like this. So here I see that y-intercept of zero comma negative one, and here, I mean, for this function, doesn't include that point zero comma negative one, but then we see these points one comma one, two comma three, and so on, right? We've got a line with a slope of two. Oops, let me try that again. And so here it's asking what the limit of this function is as x approaches zero. Uh, well, here we can see that uh, from the left side and from the right side, uh, the, the, this function uh, approaches the output value of negative one. And actually it's a continuous function um, you know, I can kind of trace this curve out, trace the graph of this function out without lifting up my, my pen or my pencil. Um, and so actually the function value is also negative one. Uh, here this is both the limit and the function give us a result of, of negative one. So for this next problem, um, this is one of those examples where we wanna use the squeeze theorem actually. Uh, so there's not much simplification we can do, and we can't evaluate this limit directly by plugging in uh, zero because this function is not continuous um, at, at x is equal to zero because here we see this, this fraction uh, would not be defined when we plug in x is equal to zero. So, right, we'll have to use the squeeze theorem, and the idea with the squeeze theorem is just to notice that, you know, we're dealing with this cosine function and this cosine function is actually bounded from above and below, right? No matter what I input to a cosine function, um, and maybe I'll actually, instead of using some random angle data, I'm gonna write this as, as one over x as well. Um, so no matter what the input of this cosine function is, whatever the value of one over x is, um, we, you know, when x is, when, when this fraction is defined, uh, the result is going to be less than or equal to one or greater than or equal to negative one. Right, the cosine function uh, gives out x coordinates on the unit circle and the x coordinates on the unit circle are only going to vary between negative one and one, never outside of that region. And so here, uh, if we were to take this inequality and multiply both sides of the inequality by x squared, or all sides of the inequality by x squared, uh, then we get this expression here. We get, or this inequality, we get negative x squared is less than or equal to x squared cosine of one over x is less than or equal to x squared. And so here, you know, we're multiplying all sides of our inequality by some positive number, right? X squared is gonna be positive no matter what, so I don't have to worry about changing or reversing my inequality signs, right? That only happens when we multiply or divide each side by a negative number, and that's not the case here. So this is perfectly valid. And then what we can do here is we can, uh, you know, we're interested in taking the limit as X approaches zero of this middle expression. 
And well, if this middle expression is bounded below by negative x squared and it's bounded above by x squared, it's also going to be the case that uh, the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x squared is going to be less than or equal to x squared cosine of 1 over x. And that's going to be less than or equal to, uh, oops, I should include the limit for this middle part as well. So the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared cosine of 1 over x. And this is going to be less than or equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared. Now here, for these bounds, right, we can evaluate these limits directly. Uh, these are continuous functions. Uh, there's, there's no holes or, or uh, discontinuities in, this, in the graphs of either of these two functions. And so you know, the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x squared, this is 0. Right, if we imagine the graph of negative x squared, uh, and we imagine the x values approaching 0 from both sides, uh, well, they're both going to approach an output value of 0 as well. And this is also the case when we take the limit as uh, x approaches 0 of x squared. And so here what we're saying is that this limit as x approaches 0 of x squared cosine of 1 over x, well, we can see that this is going to be bounded between 0 and 0, and so this limit must itself be 0. Right, this is the idea of the squeeze theorem. And so here I can go ahead and draw the conclusion that this is going to be equal to 0. And I should also point out, you know, here we can see this graphically, um, this blue curve is our curve x squared cosine of x. And you know, it is, it's undefined x is equal to 0. Maybe I'll unplot the other two points. Oh, this should be, sorry, this should be not cosine of x. This should be cosine of uh, 1 over x. OK, so here, you know, this graph gets a little chaotic near the center. And, you know, that's kind of understandable because we've got an input of 1 over x there. And if we look at x squared and we look at the graph of negative x squared, well, uh, these two graphs bound our function from above and below. And so because both of these graphs have uh, the limit as x approaches 0 of both of these functions is 0, and, and x squared cosine of 1 over x is sort of sandwiched between these two functions, uh, well, the limit as x approaches 0 of our function of interest is also going to be 0. OK, so let's take a look at this next example, uh, 1j. We again want to evaluate this limit. And here again, it's a limit as x approaches 0. And so again, we can't uh, evaluate this limit directly by substituting x is equal to 0 because uh, this, is, this expression is undefined at x is equal to 0. But with radical expressions, um, like what we have in our numerator, uh, we can do some manipulation here by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate. Right, so we can multiply by 5 plus x plus the square root of 5, oops, 5 minus x in the numerator and the denominator. And so why is this beneficial? Well, you know, here when we multiply out the, the numerator uh, of both of these two fractions, we'll end up with a difference of squares. And here, uh, that'll deal with the radicals, the square root signs. And so maybe let's see that um, firsthand. So here, this we still get the limit as x approaches 0 of, uh, well, here, you know, we would see that we would multiply these first terms. And that would give us this uh, square root. No, no, not square root. This would give us just 5 plus x. And then here, we would multiply the outer terms. And that would give us a. Uh, 5, so give us plus the square root of 5 plus x times the square root of 5 minus x. We'd also multiply these inner terms, giving us minus the square root of 5 plus x times the square root of 5 minus x. And then we'd multiply these last terms to get, well, 
square root of 5 uh, minus x times the square root of 5 minus x, well, that's just going to give us, with that negative sign, 5 minus x. And then these two middle terms, they cancel out, right? So this is the whole idea of doing this multiplication by the conjugate. And then we have to multiply the denominators, and so we've got 5x multiplied with, and I'm just going to leave this expression as is without distributing that 5x. Right? Eventually we're going to let x approach 0, and so we're going to see, uh, see our denominator simplify rather nicely. Um, so here what we've got is, maybe I'll just rewrite this so it just feels a little bit cleaner. This is the limit as x approaches 0. Of uh, So we've got 5 plus x, and then if I distribute this negative sign, here we've got negative 5, and we've got negative negative x, so that's plus x, divided by 5x times the square root of 5 plus x plus the square root of 5 minus x. And here, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to make mistakes with signs, and so let me just double check that I haven't done anything um, uh, too wrong. So here, right, I multiplied by the sum of these two, and so here this is a plus like I expect it to be. Okay, so here we can see that this uh, subtraction of 5 and this addition of 5, those cancel out. Um, we're left with then uh, the limit as x approaches 0 of, uh, well, we've got 2x in the numerator divided by 5x times the square root of 5 plus x plus the square root of 5 plus x, 5 minus x, sorry. I always run into this issue. I write my fraction bar too early, and it ends up way too small. But that's okay. So here there's a factor of x in the numerator and a factor of x in the denominator that cancel out. And then now there's no issue with evaluating this expression at x is equal to 0. Right? So here this will obtain an almost equivalent expression um, upon this cancellation. Um, and so the limit as x approaches 0 of this expression with the x's cancelled will be the same as the limit as our original expression. And so here, from that direct evaluation, we get uh, 2 over 5 times the square root of 5 plus 0 plus the square root of 5 minus 0. And is there anything we can do with this? This is 2 over 5 times, well, here this is the square root of 5 plus the square root of 5. So that's 2 square root 5, uh, just this part here. And so this is times 2 square root 5. And we can do some cancellation here. This is 1 over 5 square root 5. And I'm not going to worry too much about rationalizing the, the denominator. This is, this is more than enough for me. Okay, so here we're given uh, two different piecewise functions, and we're asked whether these piecewise functions are continuous at x is equal to 0. So here, let's go ahead and graph this first function. Um, so here, this first function, maybe I'll do it in blue. Um, so here, it says that when x is greater than 0, but not including 0, uh, we're graphing the function e to the x. So uh, well, here, e to the x, it would start at this point 0, comma 1, right? e to the 0 is 1, but we wouldn't be including this point. And when we have x is equal to 1, well, we, we're just going to get e. So that's roughly 2.72, I believe. I always forget the decimals uh, in, in E, but I think that's about right. And so here we're going to get this sort of exponential looking curve like so, uh, with that first point 0, 1 excluded. And now the cosine function, well, uh, here we're looking at using the cosine function for all values of x less than or equal to 0. And when x is equal to 0, cosine of x is going to give us 1, right? Cosine, let me just to draw this out, right? Cosine of, of an angle is the x-coordinate on the unit circle of that angle. And so here we're saying cosine of 0 
is going to be the x coordinate of that, uh, the point on the unit circle at that angle of zero, and that's going to be one. So here, actually, we're going to fill that point in. Now the point zero comma one is included on the graph of this function because when x is zero, cosine of zero is one, and then here, uh, from then on, we're going to we're going to get our cosine function on the left side of this graph. So here, I don't have uh, the x-axis labeled in terms of pi, pi over 2, pi over 4, pi over 6. Um, I know cosine of pi is going to be negative 1, so a little bit after 3, we're going to get an, uh, an output value of negative 1. And so here, right in between, at pi over 2, that's going to be an output value of 0. So maybe it'll be, uh, pi over 2 is probably a little more than 1.5. So it'll look something like this. And then uh, a little more than 1.5 after that, after negative 3, that's maybe 4.7, 4.6 or so. We'll probably get 0 again. And our graph will look something like this. I mean, this isn't the most important detail. Um, the main idea is here that cosine, the cosine function on the left is continuous. The exponential function e to the x on the right is continuous. And then the point where we're sort of uh, the, the function changes from cosine to e to the x, well, those parts of the graph, they meet each other, and that point is included. Uh, so here we can see that the, the graph of this f of x function is continuous. So here, yes, f of x is continuous. <coughs> and now, what about this, this g of x function? Well, here g of x is it's going to be the same thing, right? e to the x for x greater than 0. That's no different than the, uh, the right side of our piecewise function uh, for f of x. But here, this cosine function, uh, here the main distinguishing factor is that uh, it's, it's only going to be cosine of x for x values less than 0 without equality. And so the difference between f of x and g of x is that here, g of x is not including this center point at 0, 1. And so here, this function is actually not continuous. You know, it's continuous on the left, it's continuous on the right, but it's not continuous at this point. And so uh, this function as a whole is not continuous. Right? So intuitively, uh, you know, I can't draw this graph entirely without picking up my pen or my pencil, and so it's not continuous. Um, maybe more uh, rigorously, uh, the idea is that some, a function is continuous at x is equal to a if the limit as x approaches a of our function is the same as what we get when we plug that value into our function. Right? In other words, as we're approaching our uh, our value of interest, here in this case it's zero, is the limit of this function the same as what we get when we evaluate the function? And here the limit is one. So for a is equal to zero, uh, here this limit is equal to one. Um, but g of zero is undefined. Right, for this piecewise function, uh, co uh, co you know, we don't have any function that's defined for the x value of 0. We're not using any function to compute an x value of 0. OK, so here, this next problem, uh, we've got a lot of limits and evaluating uh, that we want to do in this problem. Um, I, I also want to mention that I actually intended to have uh, this point plucked out at the tip of this parabola, this vertex of the parabola at the point 0, 3. And so maybe let's continue, let's work through this problem as if that point were plucked out. Um, just know that if you work through this problem with the original graph, you know, you might get a slightly different answer uh, here in this, this first part of a part D. But anyways, let's just, let's just keep working through this. So the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of f of x, if f of x is the graph above, sorry, the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of f of x, right? This is saying uh, the limit as x approaches 0 from the left side, from the negative side of things, um, 
Well, that's that's the limit as, as x approaches from this left side here, and we see that that's going to be equal to uh, 3. And actually, the limit as x approaches 0 from you know, this positive side of the graph, or from the right side, uh, this is also equal to negative, or to equal to positive 3. And so because the, the left side of the limit and the right side of the limit, they agree, um, we say that the limit as a whole is also equal to 3. It's defined, and it's, it's the same as the left and right side of the limits. Now what about this function evaluated at 0? Well, here um, in this updated example of this graph, uh, we don't have uh, an output for this, this input here. f of 0 is, is, is undefined. And so, you know, in, if you worked through this example before, you would have gotten that f of 0 is equal to 3 because that, that plucked out point wasn't there before. But just to give this example a little bit more, uh, make it a little bit more interesting, um, let, me, let me pluck out that point. Okay, so next we're asked to examine more or less the same questions, but except uh, at an x value of 2. So what's the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of, of 2? Um, well, here, as x approaches 0 from the left, uh, the values of our function approach, approach negative 1. And from the right, uh, well, the function values approach positive 2. And so on the right side of this, this graph to the right of, of, of 2, our function values are near uh, 2 approaching from above. And then what about the limit as x approaches 2? Well, here, because the left-handed side, the left-handed limit and the right-handed limit, uh, they don't agree. And we've got negative 1 for one and 2 for the other. Uh, here, this is, this is uh, undefined, or it does not exist. Maybe I'll say that. And then f of 2, well, it's the function value at 2. And in this case, um, the, the point we see corresponding to an x value of 2 here uh, is, is, well, it has an output of 3. So this is equal to 3. And so this is just an illustration that, OK, we can get a left-handed limit. We can get a different right-handed limit. And actually, we can get something else that's different. Uh, the, function, uh, the, the function evaluated at that x value, that can also be different. Um, and we can also see in parts a through d that we can have all the limits and still have the function be undefined. And then in this last example, um, we're looking at the limits as uh, we approach 4 from every different direction. Oh, I've made a small typo here. This should be not 4 to the x, this should be 4 from the right, right? 4 with an exponent plus. So here this is uh, the limit as x approaches 4 from the left. Well, from the left, we're looking at our function approaching an output value of 4 as well. And then from the right, well, this graph is uh, trending downwards. It looks like it's heading down towards negative infinity. And then from the left and the right together, well, these two limits, uh, they don't agree. And so the limit as a whole doesn't exist. And then also because uh, there, there's this discontinuity here, there's, there, we don't see uh, any point corresponding to an x value of 4. Um, f of 4 is undefined. OK, so for this next problem, we have uh, three different tasks to do for each of these equations. Maybe I won't do all of these equations. Uh, here, maybe just for the sake of simplicity, I'll do A and C. So for this problem here, we want to, uh, first off, we want to find the derivative function for parts A and C uh, using the limit definition of the derivative. So you know, soon enough, we'll learn all these different tools for computing derivatives. Um, and maybe you're already familiar with some of them. Uh, but here, I'm specifically interested in uh, computing the derivative function using the limit definition, sort of, you know, from the first principles of, you know, how we started this, this calculus course, just, you know, taking secant lines and letting those uh, secant lines approach the tangent line. So here, you know, the idea for, for computing the, the 
derivative function of f of x is equal to the square root of x plus 4, uh, well, what we have to do is we ought to take the limit as h approaches 0 of here we're going to take f of x plus h, take away f of x, and divide that by h. Right, so the idea here, maybe I'll just draw a rough sketch of a picture just to make sense of how things are, uh, where this comes from. Right, so here we've got uh, a square root function that's been shifted to the left four units. This is, this is f of x is equal to x plus four, the square root of x plus four. And so the idea is that, you know, for this derivative function, you know, if we're taking any tangent line, if we want to find any tangent line, well, what we're really going to do is we're going to compute the slope of the secant line. Uh, maybe I'll call this particular value x, and this is x plus h. We're going to let h, this distance, uh, approach 0. We're going to let x plus h really get closer and closer to x. And so what's the slope of the secant line? Well, it's the y value f of x plus h, take away this y value, f of x, divided by the change in the x values, well, that change is x plus h to minus x, it's just h. So this is the origin of our limit definition of the derivative here, and so here we can use that to compute this derivative. So well, the limit as h approaches 0 of, well, what's f of x plus h? We're going to take this x plus h here, and input it into our f of x function, so this is going to be the square root of x plus h, right, input to our square root of x plus 4 function, so that's going to have a plus 4 tacked onto the our input of x plus h. And then next we're going to subtract away f of x, so this is subtract away the square root of x plus 4, all divided by h. And so, you know, we kind of went through a very similar problem earlier in this video. Um, we, we computed some limit, we evaluated some limit, uh, including radical expressions, by multiplying the top and bottom by the conjugate of that radical expression. So here this is going to be the limit as h approaches 0, uh, and we can multiply by the conjugate, um, and maybe I'll, I'll just write that on, onto the side here. So if we multiply by the conjugate, Actually, I'll move this picture to give us some space. So we can multiply by the conjugate. So this is the square root of x plus h plus 4 plus square root of x plus 4 all over the square root of x plus h plus 4 plus the square root of x plus 4. So we're multiplying that to the numerator and the denominator. And when we multiply to the numerator, you know, we get this difference of squares here. You know, the square of the first and the square of the second uh, subtracted away. So this is going to be uh, x plus h plus 4 minus uh, here x plus 4. Now I encourage you to expand that multiplication out to multiply this entire numerator to the entire uh, second numerator and see that this is what you get. And then here we also have h, we have uh, the square root of x plus h plus 4 plus the square root of x plus 4. And so here, you know, when we distribute that negative sign, well, we get negative x and we get negative 4. So here maybe I'll just put that in right here. This is minus x minus 4, and we get some cancellation here, right? x take away x, 4 take away 4, and we're just left with h in the numerator. So we have h as a factor of the numerator, h as a factor of the denominator, and so these will cancel out as well through division, and we'll just be left with the limit as h approaches 0 of 1 over the square root of x plus h plus 4 plus the square root of x plus 4. And so now this, this uh, fraction is not undefined when we let h uh, go to 0, um, so here we can evaluate directly, and we get 1 over the square root of x plus 0 plus 4 
plus the square root of x plus 4. And so, you know, without this 0 here, we actually have two copies of the same radical, uh, radical expression. And so I can write that as 1 over 2 square root x plus 4. So this is our derivative function. This is uh, f prime of x. Plugging in values, x values into this function tell us the slopes of the tangent lines to our original graph, our original function. And so that's not all we were tasked with doing. Uh, so here we computed the derivative function using the limit definition of the derivative. Now we want to find the slope of the tangent line at x is equal to 2. So the slope of the tangent line at x is equal to 2, well, that's obtained by evaluating this derivative function at 2, at x is equal to 2. So here, if I take f prime of 2, this is going to give us the slope of the line tangent to the graph of f of x at x is equal to 2. So here I'm going to plug in 2. So we have 1 over 2 square root 2 plus 4. So this is 1 over 2 square root 6. So here we've got the slope of the, the tangent line to our curve at x is equal to 2. And then the last thing we want to do is we want to uh, determine if the original function is increasing or decreasing at x is equal to 2. So if the slope of our tangent line is this quantity here, what this is saying is, is that uh, the slope of our tangent line is just 1 over 2 square root 6. Well, because this slope is positive, uh, our graph is increasing from left to right. And so here we can kind of see in our original picture that uh, I'll erase some of the, the clutter here. So hopefully it still kind of makes a little bit of sense. Um, if we look at an x value of 2, and maybe I'll just roughly sketch that, that's right here. Um, and we look at the slope of the tangent line to this curve at x is equal to 2. Well, we can see that that tangent line is positive. The slope of that tangent line is positive. It's 1 over 2 square root 6. And what that's saying is that uh, our graph is increasing. It's going up from left to right at this point. And so let's do the same thing for h of x. So h of x is equal to 3 over x. So we've got h of x is equal to 3 over x. And actually, I realized that I was I made a mistake to name this function h of x. Maybe let me label it k of x is equal to 3 over x. It's, you, know, you don't want to have the same symbol appear multiple times um, in, your, in your expressions and then have them mean different things. I don't want to have h represent my function and h be the limit that I'm trying to evaluate. So here, uh, let, me, let me just label this function k of x. Um, but here what we want to do is we want to find k prime of x. And this is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of, uh, well, here we're going to take our function and evaluate it at x plus h. We're going to subtract that from uh, the function uh, evaluated at x. And we're going to divide this by h. Right? So this is the limit definition of the derivative. Here this is f of x plus h. This is f of x. And then here in the denominator, we have h. And so here we can, we can evaluate this limit by uh, combining our two fractions in the numerator. I can multiply the first fraction by x over x. Right? So we've got 3x over x times x plus h. And I can multiply the second fraction by x plus h. Right? That's sort of the missing factor to keep these from having a common denominator. And then I still have my division by h. And so here, I'm going to distribute this, this numerator out in this second fraction. We've got 3 times x plus h. So that's 3x plus 3h. 
So hopefully you're okay with me erasing this for now just to rewrite it. So 3x plus 3h. And now whenever we subtract two fractions, we want to make sure we're subtracting one numerator from the other. And so that just because I happen to have this 3x here as the first term doesn't mean that that's the only thing that's being subtracted. Actually, this entire numerator is being subtracted, right? We're subtracting one entire numerator from the other. And so here this becomes the limit as h approaches 0 of, now what is this? This is 3x minus 3x minus 3h, right? We're subtracting 3x and we're subtracting 3h over x times x plus h, all over h. I almost forgot that. That would have been a big issue. Okay, so this is uh, our new limit, and here I can see that this 3x and this minus 3x cancel out. And then uh, here we have a division of two different fractions, and this is kind of the, this is the big fraction bar, right? This was the original main denominator. We just kind of combined the different pieces of our numerator together. Um, and so really this, this fraction here can be seen as well, negative 3h over x times x plus h, and we're dividing that by h. And so to divide by h is just to multiply by the reciprocal of h. So I'm going to rewrite this division by h as multiplication by the reciprocal of h, 1 over h. And so typically when you're dealing with this big fraction here, um, actually maybe I, I think I was about to say something that I don't think I'd be able to say so clearly. I don't think it offers too much. Let me just keep moving forward. So here, uh, when we multiply by 1 over h, we get the limit as h approaches 0 of negative 3 over h times x times x plus h times h. And this factor of h in the numerator and the denominator cancel out. And so as we let h approach 0, uh, we, we get negative 3 over x times x plus 0. And so at the end of the day, our derivative function is negative 3 over x squared. This is k prime of x. And so the next thing we wanted to do with this is we wanted to evaluate uh, this derivative at x is equal to 2. So we've got negative 3 over 2 squared. So this comes out to be negative 3 over 4. And so this is, uh, well, it's the derivative, the output of the derivative function at x is equal to 2. And this tells us the slope of the tangent line at x is equal to 2. And so if the slope is negative, that's telling us that our function is decreasing uh, here. Uh, and then that slope of that tangent line is negative 3 over 4. Okay, so the next problem I'd like to look at is uh, here this one that says find the equation of the tangent line to f of x is equal to the square root of x at the point 4 comma 2. So this problem is very similar to the problems that we were looking at just a moment ago. Um, but we also want this equation of the tangent line. So we're going to need to find the slope of this tangent line. So we need to find the derivative. We need to evaluate the derivative to get us the slope of the tangent line. And then we need a point on the tangent line so that we can write down the equation of that tangent line. And so let's, let's start by finding the derivative. So f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h. So here we're inputting x plus h into our square root function take away f of x. So f of x is just the square root of x, all divided by h. And I guess I picked a lot of the same kinds of problems. Um, so here we're going to go through the same motion. We're going to multiply by the, the conjugate here. And so we get the limit as h approaches 0 of what we end up with uh, x plus h minus x all over h times square root of x plus h plus the square root of x. And so these x's cancel out 
the h factor cancels out and we're just left with this constant term one. And so here, uh, if we let h approach zero, what we get is one over the square root of x plus the square root of x. This is equal to one over two square root x. This is f prime of x. And so here we, we want to find the slope of the tangent line. We need a point on the tangent line as well to get the equation of this tangent line. And so what's the slope of the tangent line at this point? Well, we, we get the slope by plugging in that uh, x value into this function. Right, so maybe just to draw a rough sketch of what's going on, here we've got the square root of x. We know that at the point, uh, at the x value of 4, we have a y value of 2. And so here, uh, this function tells us the slope of our tangent line. And we get it by plugging in 4 into this derivative function. Right? So f prime of 4 is equal to 1 over 2 times the square root of 4. This is 1 over 2 times 2. This is 1 fourth. That's the slope of this tangent line. Now remember that uh, we can quickly graph or quickly find the equation of a line uh, using point slope form. And so here if we uh, know a point and the slope of our line, we have y take away the y value of the point is equal to uh, the slope of our line times x take away the x value of that point that we know on our line. And so here we know the slope of 1 fourth. Uh, we actually have a point on our tangent line. It's actually the point where the tangent line is connecting with the graph. So here this is the point 4 comma 2. And so really one equation of this tangent line is, well, here this is 1 fourth x minus 4 is equal to y take away, this is the y value of the, the point that we know on our tangent line, y take away 2. And so this is a perfectly valid equation of the line, um, but sometimes we might want to write this in slope-intercept form. And so here we can do that by distributing that 1 fourth and adding 2 to both sides. So this is 1 fourth x plus 1. So this is the equation of our tangent line. And so now the last problem we have here is that we're given this graph. It looks like some graph of a sinusoidal function, but we don't have the details about this graph to actually find the equation of this tangent line, or not this tangent line, the, the equation of this function. And so let's just use what we know about the graph, what we understand about the graph, to sketch out the graph of the derivative function, the graph of the function that shows us all of the slopes of the tangent lines. And so one thing I want you to notice is that here for the graph of the derivative function, we'll notice that the slope of the tangent line at this point here is zero. And so here, if I'm graphing my derivative function in, maybe let's say purple, let's, let's say this is, this is f of x, and let's say uh, f prime of x is in purple, well then I know that you know, f prime of x, for every x value it gives us its outputs, are the, the slopes of the tangent lines at those x values to our original function. And so the slope of the tangent line at this x value here I know it's zero, right? This is a horizontal tangent line. And so I know f prime of whatever this x value is looks like it's zero. And that's actually the case for, you know, at this point two, we've got another horizontal tangent line, a slope of zero. Here's another slope of zero. At these points here, we know that our, our derivative function is gonna output zero because the slopes of the tangent lines are zero the derivative function outputs the slopes of the tangent lines. Now the next things to notice are that uh, at, the, at this point here, 
this it looks like that's the point with the steepest slope downwards right so here you know the tangent line maybe looks something like this and it looks like the tangent lines don't get any steeper than this this is the steepest and it's actually steepest uh, going down so here we're saying that the slope is a negative and this is the most negative it gets and so it looks like it's a little bit more than a slope of negative one, maybe close to a slope of negative two. So here maybe I'll write it like this. Maybe I'll write it like here. Actually, it looks very close to a slope of negative two. So maybe I'll just yeah, I'll plot it right there. I should plot it in purple to be consistent. And so here, you know, notice that the slopes are negative. The slopes of the tangent lines earlier in this, this graph, so you know, maybe out here, they're negative, but they're just less negative. And then they start getting more and more negative around this point, and then they start getting less and less negative. And so here, what we can see is that, you know, the graph of our derivative function, the outputs are gonna be more and more negative here, up until this lowest point, that's gonna be where the slopes are the most steep in the downwards direction of our original function. So f prime of x is going to give us the most negative value. And then they're going to head back upwards. There's still going to be negative slopes for our original function, but the slopes are less negative. They're less steep in the downwards direction. And then here, after this point where the slopes are zero, the horizontal, we've got a horizontal tangent line, uh, our slopes are positive, right? We can kind of see that they're, they're, the tangent lines have a positive slope going upwards. And again, they achieve their steepest slope kind of at this point here. And it looks like this tangent line has a slope of 2. And so maybe I'll write that down. I mean, I think that's a fair estimation, is that at this point, we've got a slope of 2 for a tangent line, so f prime of that x value is going to give us roughly 2. And then here we can see that the slopes are, you know, they're, they're slightly positive, more positive, and then less positive. And so we can see that they increase the slopes, increase up until this point, and they decrease back down. And we can see that this kind of continues on and on. And so this is a, a rough picture of our derivative function.